useful. Exodus chapter 7, it has begun. We have made it to the plagues, which means our DeLorean has arrived in 2020. <laughs> See, there, there's a double right reference for you right there. See, there you go. Yeah, there you go. 80s for a thousand, Alex. But in our seriousness, the judgment of God against Egypt has begun. It will begin in this chapter. It will begin in this section. Now, lesson for us that will be important as we move through this. The judgment of God is always, always measured, controlled, and appropriate. Okay? We'll actually see an example of that as we work through this section. As we work through all of the plagues of Egypt, we will actually see that they are systemic in nature. It's not like God sitting up in heaven going, what do we got? I don't know, draw a card. Uh, or flip a coin. Heads, it'll be fog. Tails, it'll be gnats. It's tails. All right, send in the gnats, boys. No, we're actually working on... Egypt in a specific way to accomplish specific things. We'll begin to see that a little bit this morning as we begin. So the question then becomes, how does seeing the ordered judgment of God help us today? Because isn't that kind of what we always want to deal with? We want to understand it, and then we want to do what? We want to apply it. Well, has God changed the way that he deals with the world? No. Which means his judgment then was ordered and controlled. Meaning his judgment now is what? ordered and controlled. And not just that, we learn quite a bit from people doing dumb things, don't we? I mean, that you, you should anyway. That's what we try to tell our children. When your children get ready to do something, like, don't do that. And they look at you and go, well, why not? Because I did that. And, and see the scar and see these, they, they, that's what this is. Don't, don't do that. You want them to go, I was, like, I was dumb like that once. I played the stupid game. I won the stupid prize. Don't play the stupid game. We want them to learn from our mistakes. Well, we want to learn from Bible mistakes too. And unfortunately, we get a whole bunch of them. And today gives us a good example of that. So... Exodus chapter 7, 14 through 25. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is stubborn. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is going out to the water and station yourself to meet him on the bank of the Nile. You shall take in your hand the staff that was turned into a serpent. You shall say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to you, saying, Let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. But behold, you have not listened until now. Thus says the Lord, By this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will strike the water that is in the Nile with the staff that is in my hand, and it will be turned into blood. The fish that are in the Nile will die. The Nile will become foul. The Egyptians will find difficulty in drinking water from the Nile. Then the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their rivers, over their streams, and over their pools, and over all their reservoirs of water, that they may become blood. And there will be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. So Moses and Aaron did even as the Lord had commanded. And he lifted up the staff and struck the water that was in the Nile in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants. And all the water that was in the Nile was turned to blood. The fish that were in the Nile died. The Nile became foul so that the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile. And the blood was through all the land of Egypt. But the magicians of Egypt did the same with their secret arts. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he did not listen to them as the Lord had said. Then Pharaoh turned and went into his house with no concern over this. So all the Egyptians dug around the Nile for water to drink, for they could not drink of the water of the Nile. Seven days passed after the Lord had struck the Nile. Oh, that escalated quickly, didn't it? So, the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is stubborn. He refuses to let the people go. We know this already. You've told us like a dozen times. Why are we being told this again? God is going to make sure that, they, that he leaves no doubt. You will know who is in charge, who has done this, who is in command. This is going to actually become a lesson in Scripture. If you uh, fast forward and go to Romans 9, Paul understood this and used it as an example explaining human interaction. What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. 
For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this per very purpose I raised you up, to demonstrate my power in you, that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. This is how God works. He will accomplish his purposes regardless of how stubborn you are, how sinful you are, or how good you think you might be. God will rule and reign, and he will leave no doubt. Jesus used this as an example as well when he walks into the temple, John 9. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? Jesus answered, It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Now catch this. Every time something bad happens, what do we want to blame it on? We want to blame it on sin. There's evil in the world because of sin. And that is true. There's also evil in the world because at this point in time, God allows it. God could put a stop to it. He could stop this world from spinning. He could usher in his final kingdom. Christ could return and we could be done. He has not done that, which means what must we do? We must live every day faithfully, trying to figure out day in and day out, what is God doing? How does this glorify him? And how does this strengthen us to do the works in him? This is actually the conversation. I don't think she'll mind me saying this out loud. This is actually a conversation I had with Gail. She's like, I get another diagnosis. They might be finding another cancerous thing that they need to take out. And I said, well, how are you doing? She goes, well, this is for a reason. I don't know what it is yet, but I'll figure it out. And I'm like, thank you. <laughs> That's a good answer. Now, it's one thing to say that. You know what it's another thing to do? Actually walk it and mean it. And I hope she is. I do. That's why I said, if you get a chance to call Gail, call her and encourage her and walk down that road with her. That's what I'll be doing in the next couple of weeks. This is how we function. Look, bad stuff is going to happen to everyone. And we can sit there and go, well, sin is just the cause of all of this. And it might be. But at the same token, could God have stopped this? Yes. There are people on the Alabama coast right now who watched 30 inches of rain fall last week. Can you pro... 30 inches. They had 7 to 10 feet of storm surge plus 30 inches of rain. Which means if your house was at sea level, by the time that was all done, it was 13 feet underwater. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's wow. Now, there's natural evil. This world is trying to kill us. We see this day in and day out. Could God have put a hand down and said, no, that storm will not go any further? Yes, he could have. But he did not, which means there is something in this work for the people of that area, for the people of the surrounding area, for us, that glorifies God, strengthens us in our security towards him, and glorifies the kingdom that he is building. What we must do day in and day out is figure out how does that work and what's going on. That is why you're getting this hammered point in the book of Exodus here. God is making sure that the Israelites know who reigns. God reigns. The Egyptians don't have power over you. God does. I could remove you at any point, but I'm going to demonstrate my power. I'm going to systematically, fundamentally take Egypt apart so that you will have no doubt who sits upon the throne of creation. That's what's going on. That's why you're getting this reminder. Right, a whole pile right off the bat, right? There we go. Verse 15, go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is going out to the water and station yourself to meet him on the bank of the Nile. Now notice where we are not. Are we meeting Pharaoh at court? Are we meeting Pharaoh on his turf? Sort of. We are at the river. Why are we at the river? Remember, this is the lesson we told you the first time Moses was given this. The Nile River is deity in motion for the Egyptians. It is the source of life and crops. I mean, this is, this is an area of the world. There are not a whole lot of places you can actually live and live fairly well. Egypt is one of the few because every year the Nile floods its banks. Well, the reason why the Nile is viewed as deity in motion is because until the 1960s, process that, the 1960s with the, uh, what's the name of this thing? I wrote it down so I wouldn't mess it up again. The, uh, the Aswan High Dam, which was finished around 1970. Until that dam was finished in 1970, the Nile flooded. However, 
Some years it flooded, some years it actually didn't. Some years it flooded a whole lot, and some years it didn't. And the problem is it's an arid place. If the Nile doesn't flood and actually add nutrients to the soil, you can't grow things. But if it floods too much, it inundates the ground, and you can't grow things either. So you're dependent on the Nile to do its thing until 1970 when we could actually begin to control it and bend it to our will. So if you lived in this area and you had no concept of what's going on, who's in charge of that? God is. And since they saw a God everywhere, the Nile itself is a God. We are now going to the ultimate of turf here. We're not going to meet Pharaoh at his court, in his palace. We're going to meet him where his God flows by his home. We're going to meet him as he prepares to go down into it, and we're going to challenge him right there. You shall take in your hand the staff that was turned into a serpent. You shall say to him, The Lord, Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to you, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. But behold, you have not listened until now. Notice the authority. Does Moses, do Moses and Aaron get to make this declaration on their own? No. Who's, on whose behalf are they making this, this claim? It's on behalf of God. How do you know? Do you notice the symbol of authority? Exodus chapter 4. Moses took his wife and his sons, mounted them on a donkey, and returned to the land of Egypt. Moses also took the staff of God in his hand. This is going to become a recurring theme here in Exodus. Moses walks in. How, how, was, the, how was the snake formed? What are we going to turn the water to blood with? When you remember the crossing of the Red Sea. <laughs> remember the cartoon, you know? <laughs> Watch Charlton Heston, the whole movie. What's he doing? <laughs> it's a symbol of authority. Not his authority. Not Aaron's authority. God's authority. Why? Because it's the only authority that is. Romans 13 again. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. Why? For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. This is the other reason for the reminder that we're getting here in Exodus. God rules. Pharaoh didn't just win the lottery, be born into the right family. He wasn't smarter than everybody else. Who made sure that that man was on that throne at this time? God did. It's not an accident. It's not a surprise. That's the friction point of the book of Exodus. And by the way, welcome to the friction point of life in general. Now, I won't run over and grab it. Why do you think... Over 45% 40, over of the people in that survey who go to church once a week thought that God will accept the worship of Christians, Muslims, Jews, and it doesn't matter. It's not that they don't know any better. They don't want to know any better. Because what's the friction point there? If God defines proper worship, then who doesn't? I don't. Who do I want to be the one to defining things? Me! Welcome to pride and idolatry in action. The friction point of life is who is in charge. Um, part of our uh, part of that little Bible curriculum that we use for children's church and Cameron uses for her Sunday school class. That's actually one of the songs that they sing. Who will you trust? Who will you listen to? How are you gonna live your life? These are the th uh, these are the oh, the word. What's the word, Con Connor? This is the choice we've got to wrestle through, every girl and boy and man and wife. See, there you go. See? You, you, if you can hear the little muttering in the background, there's my kids singing it. They've heard it way too many times. That's the welcome to the friction of life. Who's on the throne? God is. Who do I wish was on the throne? I wish it was me, because I'm awesome. You know why I know that? Because I know me. No, what's, what's the biblical truth? No, because you know you, you know what? That you are not awesome, but that God rules and that God reigns. So... We continue based on that. 17. Thus says the Lord, By this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will strike the water that is in the Nile with the staff that is in my hand, and it will be turned into blood. This is the declaration. You will know who Yahweh is. As opposed to happy. And yeah, that, that, that's actually a dude. H-A-P-I. He is the Egyptian god of the Nile flood. They're very specific. So not the God of the Nile, just the God of the Nile flood. 
<laughs> yeah. So, and, and just so you can be as demented as I am with pop culture, every time I think of his name, my brain goes, because I'm happy, which is that stupid song that came out a couple of years ago that I hate. No, not happy, happy, joy, joy. That's Red and Stimpy. <laughs> No, because I'm happy right along if you feel... Yeah, it's, it's, it's a terrible song. Don't look it up. It'll be stuck in your head for the rest of your life. I'm not even kidding. I'm not even kidding. He is the god of the Egyptian... The Egyptian god of the Nile flood. He was actually viewed as the... As one of, depending on which mythology you trace, one of the parent gods of Egypt. Because, again, the Nile flooding is... It's kind of a big deal. It's the thing, it's the thing that determines every year whether or not you live, die, starve, have crops. It was so important that the temple dedicated to him actually had a water meter that the priests would monitor daily so that they could attempt to predict when the flood would occur and how it would occur. And it was their job to offer sacrifice and prayers so that the flood would occur at the right time, with the right height, and all that good stuff. He was their God of provision, their God of sustenance, their sustainer and builder of their lives. Now, time out. Who actually is those things? Yahweh is. Matthew 5. You have heard that it was said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Why? Because he causes his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. This is, again, one of the lessons why, when calamity occurs, we individually have to examine it. So for those people dealing with 13 feet of water in their living room, were none of them Christians? What are the odds? I mean, it's Alabama. <laughs> if there's going to be a place in this country that's going to have somebody living there that's a Christian, it's going to be where? Alabama. It's going to be the Bible Belt, right? Somewhere. Having come from the Bible Belt, it's probably not a great assumption all the time, but... <laughs> down near Bible, mobile is not. <laughs> good, good point. But the odds that no one who was Christian was affected in this are pretty minuscule. So does that mean they have been hit with the judgment of God? Well, well, no. But who's got to determine that? They do. This is the beauty of what God is doing. So God allows this storm to go through, and he's dealing with the unbeliever. He's dealing with the believer. He is cursing. He is refining, he is purifying, he is turning, he is picking somebody up and shaking them so they won't do that again. There are all, and he is doing that for all of those people in all of that area, and he's doing it at the same time. He is the sustainer, he is the judge, and he is the one that we have to recognize. God is right here by attacking the Nile, striking at the heart of the Egyptian pantheon, the heart of their gods, the Nile itself, and Hepi, the god of the flood of the of the Nile. If you want to remember this, this was our Thanksgiving service three years ago. You ready for your pop quiz? You ready? Give thanks to the Lord for He is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. Remember, why do you remember that? Because we read that entire psalm, Psalm 136, and that refrain is repeated every single one of those like 30 verses. Give thanks to the Lord for He is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. We remember that. Now, if you remember through that, that psalm, that was for his blessings. The curses on Egypt were mentioned in that. He smote the Egyptians at the Red Sea. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. Sometimes God's judgment is how he demonstrates his goodness for his people. Not just, not on us, but on the enemies of us. So, we're going to turn the water into blood. Verse 18, the fish that are in the Nile will die, and the Nile will become foul, and the Egyptians will find difficulty in drinking water from the Nile. Well, when the water turns to blood, that's kind of one of those duh moments. The things that live in the water that need the water when there's no more water do what? They die. The people that drink the water when there's no more water, we find difficulty in drinking the water now, don't we? So this is one of those obvious things. So then the Lord said to Moses, "Say to Aaron, take your staff, stretch out your hand over the waters and the res uh, I'm sorry, over the waters of Egypt, over the rivers, over the streams, over the pools, over the reservoirs, that they may become blood and there will be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone." Now, catch this. Is this about a river? No. This is life. I mean, imagine you woke up one day, and normally you would go down the day before, or the evening before, and you would draw some water out of this lovely river that flows by your home, and that's where you would have water for the night. 
And that would be how you'd start off the next morning. So you'd be able to, you know, start bread and cook and do things. And then after you used up the water you drew the night before, you would go back to the river and you would draw more water for that day. So you woke up one morning and you put some water aside in some stone vessels to have a stockpile and you pour it out and it's blood. And then the water in your bucket that you left overnight is now blood. Well, what are we going to go do? We're going to yell at the kids for goofing off because we don't know who did this and we're going to do what? We're going to go back to the river. Hmm. This would be a problem. All right, fine. There's a little pool over there that we set aside from the river water. We'll go get some of that. It's blood too. How much of your life just changed? Oh, I... God isn't just talking about a river. He's not just talking about one of the gods of your pantheon. Yahweh is here talking about what? Everything. If it came from that river, it is in trouble. Why is that the case? Psalm 36. Your loving kindness, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like a great deep. O Lord, you preserve man and beast. How precious is your loving kindness, O God. The, and the children of men take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They drink their full of the abundance of your house, and you give them to drink of the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. Now if that is true of God's people, what is true of not God's people? None of those things. How do we know that? Exodus chapter 7 teaches you that. My life doesn't come from a river. It doesn't come from my stockpile. It doesn't come from my planning. My security is not from what I've set aside in the house, from what we've set aside in the reservoir. My safety is not in my government. It's not in my strength. It's not in my self-defense class. My security, my safety, my provision all come from where? From God. This is the lesson that is being taught. Now, does that mean your 401k is evil? No, I didn't say that. My concern is if that becomes your source of security. I mean, now, here's where some of the blessings of the last, oh, 15 years in this country have been very well learned by some people, haven't they? How many times have people looked at their retirement in this country the last 15 years and just watched it go away? Literally twice in the last 15 years. When that, when that housing bubble crashed, what was that, 2000, what, 2008, 2012, somewhere in that ballpark? How many people looked at their 401ks and they had enough money to retire and then they woke up the next morning and it isn't there anymore. It's just gone. And we shut the whole economy down earlier this year. And how many people woke up a month later and looked at their retirement and went, it's just gone. Now that's a tragedy. I am not going to deny that in the least. But is God up in heaven going, well, what are they going to do? How are they going to live? No. Now, the person who does not know God will echo those sentiments. The person that knows God should be the beginning of Job's wisdom, which says what? The Lord gives, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. I don't know how I'm going to live, but I know I'm going to walk in godliness. And that means no matter what happens, no matter how hard this life is, there will be a kingdom of safety, security, and provision at the end of my journey. And that's where I'm going, and that's what I long for, and that's where my hope is. It is a, puring, a purifying and a cleansing of this world. So, the Christian on the Alabama coast who wakes up this morning and goes, it's just, it's gone. It's, it's all gone. You're right. It is. And well, it's not cool. It's all gone. And we're going to sit here and we're going to weep and we're going to mourn and we're going to talk about how terrible this is. And at some point, we're going to wake up and figure out how we live forward because everything that is gone is not where your life was. It were things that were temporary moving you to a permanent kingdom in godliness. That is where your life should be. And that's one of the reasons why these temporary things can be taken so easily. It's a reminder constantly that it's not where we put our hope. It's not where we put our life. It's not where we put our trust and our hope and our love. It's supposed to be in God. How do we know this? You literally get to see it in action here in the book of Exodus. You get to see God teaching his people that the plans that we make, the things that we trust, in can all be struck. What is the one thing that cannot be struck? God is. That security. He is the rock that does not move. He is the foundation that cannot be shaken and that is what we are supposed to build upon. So, verse 20. 
Moses and Aaron did even as the Lord had commanded. I just have to take a time out right there. Doesn't, doesn't that just feel so good to read after everything we've read in Exodus? That like, Moses and Aaron did what they were supposed to do. It's like, you want to spike the football. Good news, I can uh, report that basically for the next 25 chapters, that's for the most part going to be what happens with Moses and Aaron, so we don't have to keep worrying about that. So we'll just, just enjoy it every time we get to read it. And he lifted up the staff and struck the water that is in the Nile, and in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, and all the water that was in the Nile was turned to blood. All right. Just because I know this is going to happen at some point. Because, let's see, it's September, so we got a couple of months before the History Channel and National Geographic Channel break out all their Christmas stuff that tell you how all the things that you read about in your Bible are wrong and they didn't actually happen. It was blood. Blood, 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 blood. It wasn't an algae. It wasn't food coloring. Nobody spilled ketchup. Um, there wasn't a Crayola marker with the cap left off that somebody dropped in there. It was blood. Exodus does not give you another option. I mean, uh, Leviticus 17. The life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is by the blood of, by, for it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. Same word. The same word for blood in Leviticus is the same word for blood here. This is not some vague understanding. This is, it, it's the red stuff in your veins is what the river has now been turned into. I, I, I figure I need to cover that because if you watch the History Channel specials at some point, they'll, they'll, they'll get to Exodus again eventually. And be like, well, you know, it might have been a red tide coming down from the Mediterranean. and it, Blood. Blood. Okay? Just make sure we covered that. Why? What's the Nile? No, it's not. <laughs> All right, so it'd be from the Persian Gulf. There you go. Now, see, there you go. You know things. Go team. So, their life-giving God, their flood God, their God in motion, what does he now do? He bleeds. And to quote the great theologian Arnold Schwarzenegger, if it bleeds... We can kill it. <laughs> and if you know that movie reference, repent, all of you. <laughs> Suddenly have images of Carl Weathers with a machine gun in one arm. So I'm, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. <laughs> what is being shown? Seriously, what are we demonstrating? The Egyptians worship this river. They worship what it provides. Who are they supposed to be worshiping? Nehemiah chapter 9. Arise, bless the Lord your God forever and ever. Oh, may your glorious name be blessed and exalted above all blessings and praise. You alone are the Lord. You have made the heavens, the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to all of them and the heavenly host bows down before you. There's the lesson right there. The Nile is the first visible manifestation of the false worship of Egypt. It's the first thing God goes after. Oh, you think this river is so special? Watch it bleed. You think the flood is so special? Watch it bleed. This is an important step. Verse 21. The fish that were in the Nile died, the Nile became foul, and the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile. Yep. And the blood was through all the land of Egypt. And again, this is striking at what aspect of your life? All of it. All of it. That's on purpose. But, verse 22, the magicians of Egypt did the same with their secret arts. Right, I just have one vital question. How does that help? We'll cover where they got their water from in a minute. But... You woke up, and all the water in the buckets, all the water in your cups, all the water's in your reservoirs, all the water in the river is blood. You're like, oh, oh yeah? Right, bring me some water, Joe. Where? Just go get me some water. All right, here we go. Pow, look, it's blood too. Huh? What do you think of that? This is why, remember last week I said this was magic tricks, David Copperfield, they're pushing on the nerve on the snakes and then throwing them down. And then the reason why this is not some dark secret satanic power is because this is what they're left with. They're making algae, food coloring, the water, the, the, the wine trick with the glass, and the, whatever they're doing. You can go look that up on YouTube. It's a fun little magic trick. It's a sleight of hand. You know how I know that? Because if you had actual power, what would have been the useful thing to do? 
Turn the blood back into water. See, that would have been helpful. Hey, look, here's our drinking reservoir. All right, you're so big and bad, you turn the water into blood. Watch this. Bam, it's water again. What are you going to do now? Oh, you turned it back into blood. Okay. <laughs> but that's not what happened. They're like, oh, yeah, we'll get some more water, and we'll turn it into blood, too. What do you think about that, huh? And you know what my answer would have been? Well, I think you're an idiot. <laughs> Because all you did was you took a bunch of water we couldn't drink. You found some water we could drink, and then you made that water into water that we can't drink. What are we supposed to be doing here? Again, I'll cover where the water comes from in just a second. So they did the scenes the same with their secret arts. Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had said. This is why I want to go through. That verse is why I want to go through that survey. Their inaction is the danger of false prophets, false teachers, and tricks for the sake of a crowd. What does it do to people's hearts? It leads them astray. Every time we proclaim something that is not true about God, we are running the risk of hardening the hearts of our hearers and turning them astray. The only way to ensure we don't do that on a regular basis is to know what? What is true and good about God. This is why we can't tolerate. That's why I'm, I'm like, when I see 99% of the people, like, I'll, I will take that as, I wish, what I say? I wish it was 100%, but I will take a 98, 99 because I need some good news in my life. <laughs> I don't get a ton of it. I need, I need a little bit. But when we see things like if only 45% of the people think that, or if only 45% you know, of the people agree that God accepts all worship, doesn't matter. That's a danger, because what are we doing? We are confirming people in their delusion. We are hardening their hearts and leading them astray. What is true of their hearts? Jeremiah 17 gives you a lovely definition. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? And we'll see this with Pharaoh in a minute. See, what they've given Pharaoh is an excuse. What's the last thing we all need? <laughs> Like, you've done this, right? Where you're like, you're at home and you got projects that you need to go do. Like, I need to go wash the dishes. Uh, you know, do this at our house. So I need to go wash the dishes. Oh, wait. But the kids just took a shower like 20 minutes ago. There's not enough hot water yet, so I won't do them right now. <laughs> and you're like, there's enough hot water to wash the dishes, but I'm not doing it because I've now given myself what? I need to go do this project in the yard, but, you know, it was a busy day yesterday and I need a day to myself where I don't have to do anything. So what do I now do? Now, like, a month goes by, and what's happening to that project out in the yard? It's still staring at me. <laughs> then you start looking at it, and you get mad at it because you, it needs to be done, and you're aggravated that it hadn't been done yet. Well, why hasn't it been done yet? Yeah, because I have it. And then, yeah, the snow comes, and I can't do it, and then I'm mad at the snow. Stupid winter. Not like I didn't know it was coming for the entire year, and I had eight months to do that, and I didn't do it. It's winter's fault. The snow just came too fast. <laughs> I mean, this is what we do. I never, I didn't have time to get to that today. Right. This is what we joke about, but we, we lie to ourselves more than anybody else. And the last thing we need is a dumb excuse. What did the stupid magicians just give Pharaoh? A dumb excuse. Because, again, he's not even seeing us. All the water is blood. We can't drink any of it. Uh, here's some water. Bam, it's now blood too. Oh, well, see? So that's not the power of God. See, it's, it's just useless. I'm going back. <laughs> So Pharaoh turned, verse 23, and went into his house with no concern even for this. See, this is the other problem, inaction. This is, again, why we have to learn, why we have to be careful. Because what happens when we are left with ourselves, our delusions, and our own ideas, and we are our little Dolly Parton theology, where we are islands in the stream, that is what we are, nowhere in between. There you go. Now you got a, a third music reference, and what is that, a second or third bad 80s reference? See, why is that bad theology? What happens when you're left by yourself? Proverbs 18. The first person to plead his case seems right. Until what? Another comes and examines him. How many times have you been like this? Where somebody runs up and tells you what happened, you're like, that's terrible. And then somebody else who saw the same thing comes and gives you the rest of the story, and you're like, you lied to me. <laughs> That's awful. Why? Because you got a biased view. How do you know it was a biased view? Because it only came from the one person, which is why, where is wisdom? Proverbs tells you this like a half a dozen times. Proverbs 24. By the wise guidance you will wage war, and in abundance of counselors there is victory. Wisdom is found in a 
multitude of counselors. That's why you go to the doctor and he looks at you and goes, well, you got this weird lump on the back of your neck. I think it's going to kill you by Tuesday. Let me cut it off. What do you do? You just schedule surgery and start hacking at my neck with a machete, right? No, you're like, well, that lump has been there for like 20 years. You know, you know what I would like someone else to do? I would just, you know, hear me out on this. I would like someone else to look at it and agree with you. What do you think? Good plan? Good plan. So this, this used to be commonplace in doctors, right? It's called a second opinion. You want it sent off to somebody else so they can look at it and go, yes, sharpen the machetes. It needs to be removed just above the shoulders. <laughs> I mean, you notice we don't do that anymore? Why do we think we're so smart? Because we have iPhones? <laughs> That's probably it. Like, hey, Google. <laughs> Yeah, I gotta be Casey. You wanna have fun? Go to the mall. Well, when the mall's allowed to have people again, and just like wait till it's crowded when we're allowed to have crowds again, and just walk in the store and go, hey Siri, and then sit down. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody, me, 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 me. <laughs> and then walk by, hey Google, and everybody's phone starts, what do you want? <laughs> now finding donut shops. So, what, what, yeah. We think that makes us brilliant. Therefore, we don't need a second opinion because we have what? Look, I have degrees. I'm a, how dare you question me? What have I told you numerous times? Question. Ask. Wonder. Read. If you don't know, ask. Because if I can't justify what I'm saying, you know what you should do? Stop listening. Welcome to Pharaoh's world. He is an island of power and authority unto himself. No, he's not. God is. And that's why, we, that's why God has that power, because God is good, and Pharaoh is not. Now, why read the Proverbs 24 verse when Proverbs gives you the same advice a dozen times? Let me read it again. By wise guidance you will wage war, and in an abundance of counselors there is victory. See, I like that reference. You know what we forget day in and day out that we're engaged in? War. You are at war, engaged in battle, every single time your eyes open in the morning. We don't think like that. Ephesians chapter 6. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Which day is the evil day? Be careful how you walk, for the days are evil. It's one of the reminders of Ephesians. Paul tells you that all the days are evil, and then tells you to resist evil in the evil days. Which is, by definition then, all of them. Ephesians 4. This is also why we do the work we do together. Because guess what? Do you have every spiritual gift so that you can wage every single war? He gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. We walk together because I have been gifted in ways that you have not. Here's the, here's the dirty little secret we don't tell enough people in churches. You have been gifted in ways that I have not. Therefore, as much as you need me, I need you. And we walk, and we work, and we minister together, doing the work of discipleship, building up God's kingdom, so that it will be complete when the time is right. I can't do that. You can't do that. We can do that. So forsaking the body, forsaking the spiritual gifts, forsaking the battle day in and day out is forsaking the very thing we are supposed to be doing that Scripture is pointing us to day in and day out. In other words, it's not living Christianly. And you're going, okay, what's your point? The survey results. How many people you read this like, how do, you, how do they think like that? What are they not doing? Now, what's the cure for that? I can get mad and throw things at my computer and I can stomp up here and raise a fit. What will I have accomplished? Not a dag blasted thing. But you know what I can do? I can rightly point you to Scripture, and I can control what? I can't control what happens in the pulpits across this country, but you know what pulpit I can control? That one. 
you cannot control the teaching that goes on in the houses around this country. But you know what houses you can control? the one you live in and you can do the work and you can mourn the people that aren't but at the same token you can do it and be strengthened to know that as much as God has called me to this action I am walking faithfully so that one day I will hear what well done good and faithful servant because I can't make you do it but I can sure as heck make me do it and so I want to and I war and I can walk together and when I see you not doing it I can say what <laughs> we've got to go not that way we got to go this way and when you see me not doing it you do the same thing you, you turn to those people at the airport you know with the orange flags you know like, <laughs> and we do the work so all right we're gonna get there verse 24 so all the Egyptians dug around the Nile for water to drink for they could not drink the water of the Nile there you go mercy of God remember when I said that his judgment is always measured and controlled this also explains where the magicians got their water what wasn't cursed? The Nile was cursed. The vessels of stone, the vessels of wood, the reservoirs, the streams, all of that was cursed. What wasn't cursed? The water in the ground, the groundwater. So, if you got a well, God left it alone. Why did he do that? Do what? You gotta live and need water. <laughs> And you need some water here. So God gave them a rescue. Now, do they have to work harder for it? Yes, they do. Are they going to be happy about it? Probably not. <laughs> do I care? Nope. Here's the other part. Does God care? Nope. But again, the judgment, you know, we joke. It's like, I got to pull this car over. He's like, oh, don't pull the car over. I was joking with Matt. He's like, I need to pull the car over and straighten these kids. I was like, no, you just take the belt off and start doing this number, you know. I'll get one of you. <laughs> That's not God's wrath. God's wrath is, you did it, you get it. It's measured. It's controlled. You get an example of that here. There's water in the ground, not cursed. They can go get it because God didn't just wave, God didn't tell them, wave the staff and I'm going to get all the waters. I'm going to get all the waters of Egypt, but there's going to be some water I'm going to set aside so that these people will live. So verse 25. This is part of the answer. Seven days passed after the Lord had struck the Nile. That's a long time to sit and stew, isn't it? Now, I don't know how far back the... This is, these are always the things I want to ask. Like, everybody else is going to be asking, I don't know what, when we get to heaven. I'm going to be like, so when the blood formed, in the, like, did it come from somewhere? Like, did it go all the way back to the source and it took a week for it to all filter out? Or was it like just south of Egypt, it was like, like if you went to the southern border of Egypt, was it like clean, drinkable water? And then when you stepped over the border, it was red now because it was blood? Like, it's, it's, it's just, I, see, you weren't wondering that, but now you are. <laughs> and you're welcome because you won't know the answer to that. Seven days. Why are we now waiting a week? What's wrong with Pharaoh's heart again? <clears throat> it's deceitful and it is wicked. And this is why we need the one another's. What happens over an extended period of time when you are left to yourself and your own thoughts and devices? Do good things come from that for most people? Like the longer you have to sit by yourself and just think about stuff. Like, do you start curing cancer and splitting the atom and, and inventing solar panels and things? <laughs> Sometimes. Or more often than not, do you start getting bitter, getting angry, finding all of your faults, seeing everything you've done wrong? Like, just try it sometime. Just wake up one morning, turn everything off, and just sit and think. Like, think about the day you had yesterday. And I guarantee you, within a minute and a half, you know what you're going to come up with from yesterday? Everything you messed up. <laughs> well, unless you're Jonathan, of course. <laughs> now, your worst enemy is you. And the accuser, Satan, you know what his ammunition is? You! Read his interactions. When he goes to tempt Jesus, what does he come up with? He tempts him with good things that Christ should want, that Christ will one day have. The offer is you can get him a different way which is really no offer at all. He doesn't have anything new under the sun. He's got what? He's got your thoughts, your ideas, and just enough twisting. Did God really say? Are you sure? Or are you positive? And then what, is Eve, what does Eve start doing? She starts thinking. Well, you know, it does look good. 
And being wise would be good. And having that knowledge to be like God, that's a good thing. So, not, so I will attain a good thing by doing the thing God told me not to do. Stop thinking. <laughs> that's where you went wrong. <laughs> that's where we all go wrong. So what is God going to leave Pharaoh to do? Sit, think, and stew. Is Pharaoh going to start, start doubting himself? No, he's going to start thinking what? That mean, evil Moses. I'm, I'm going to get that guy. I, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Many are the plans of a man's heart, but what will stand? The counsel of the Lord. Pharaoh's going to sit around and make plans. What, you've done this in the shower, haven't you? The next time I see that person, this is what I'm going to say to them. And you have the whole argument before you're done washing your hair. And then when you see them, how does that argument go? <laughs> Just like you laid it out in the shower, right? No, and you're like, they didn't play their part. Why don't they ever play their part and say the thing they're supposed to say so that I will be brilliant? What do you think Pharaoh's going to do? Next time Moses and Aaron come, you know, I'm going to tell them this one. Mm -hmm, this was him. No, it's not. No, it's not. So, seven days, bad for Pharaoh. Now, on the flip side, Christian, do you know where seven days should be good for? Should be good for us. And that's why I made the point about how you think about things and what you will dwell on, because I'm just as guilty. How often do we just dwell on the bad stuff and we can't do a single solitary thing about it? I'm guilty. Bad me. See, I'm doing it right this second. How are we supposed to evaluate our lives? I'll help you out. Psalm 139. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me. Know my anxious thoughts. And see if there be any hurtful way in me. See, that's where we stop when we actually live life. We evaluate everything we've done wrong, and we stew on it, and then we think about how we could have done it better, and then that's where we stop. Psalm 139 doesn't stop. Lead me in the everlasting way. The reason we dwell on the past and the reason we think about what we have messed up and what we have done wrong is not so that we can kick ourselves in the butt and smack ourselves in the back of the head. It's so that we can recognize that for that too, Christ has died. That this is what I have been redeemed from and that now, in Christ, I am no longer a slave to those patterns, to those thoughts, to those feelings and those desires, but I am new in Him and capable of walking in a new direction. Welcome to Christian living. Actual progressing forward in godliness. Which summarizes everything we've been talking about. Why am I not by myself? So that I don't, so I don't stew and dwell in my own thoughts. So that I can actually see the progress I should be making. Also so that I can encourage others to do the same. So that they can lift up where I am deficient. And I can lift up where they are deficient. This is going to become more and more important in the coming months and years. Uh, recent survey. Guess what percentage of businesses that have closed in the last six months will never reopen? 60. 60% of, of all of businesses that have closed in the last six months will not reopen. Lifeway was finding out that they're thinking right now between one in five and one in four, so 20 to 25 percent of churches in the next year will close because there aren't enough people and there isn't enough money to pay the bills. They're just done. This is going to become important because we are going to have a lot of people in this world that have a lot of hurt and they do not know why. And even a lot of the ones that should know why, guess what? They don't know why. The fields will suddenly be what? Ripe for harvest. But there will only be workers if we're actually doing the work day in and day out. Because guess who the workers are? It's us. We're reading the survey and you're going through going, how do people get these wrong? Congratulations, you have been put in a position. You know you can disciple, you can encourage. Which means there will be people put in your path. How will you be ready? Will you study then? No, you study now. You do the work now. You pray, you read your Bible, you walk in the one another's and you encourage them. You know what? I understand you feel like you're alone, but you are in Christ never alone. Not just because you have God, but because you have a kingdom and a community that is built in. Plug into it. Plug into it. That's the encouragement for them, and it's the encouragement for us. Because look, I know a lot of you guys are here every week. Did you notice who didn't come back? 
<clears throat> who didn't come back when the world said, we, okay, you can open up a little bit? It was the people where? On the fringes. It was that lady who sits in the back that nobody ever gets a chance to talk to. It was a guy who kind of sits off by himself who not everybody gets a chance to talk to. They're not back. What do you think the odds are they're somewhere else? Nah. Slim. That's how we lose people, and that's the only loss we actually have. We'll persevere, and we'll get there, but we've lost an opportunity. Now, was it taken from us? Probably. Do we worry about it at this point? No. For that too, Christ died. What can we do in the future? We move forward. We plug in. We do the work. We make disciples, and we encourage one another as we work on to the day of completion. And when that day comes, we will rejoice because we will have been found faithful doing the work that the Master has called us to do. If that's not true, then the answer is simple. Repent and start on that work because it's going to be the call. The judgment will come. It will be marked. It will be measured. It will be right. And we will persevere by Christ's grace through it. But that's not the only goal. The goal is to stand joyfully in that kingdom, knowing that we have been faithful until that day. Let's pray.